Hi, I'm Katie Wiskar from UBC IM POCUS, and today we're going to be talking about how to use Doppler echocardiography to measure cardiac output. So before we start, really important to underline that this technique assumes both competence in basic cardiac POCUS, as well as a thorough understanding of spectral Doppler. And if you need a refresher about spectral Doppler, I'd encourage you to visit this screencast uh, posted on the UBC IM POCUS site. So before we dive in, let's back up a second and think about why we care about cardiac output, because this is a common question, and it's worth exploring what this technique adds above basic 2D qualitative POCUS assessment of cardiac function. So to answer this question, we're first going to back up and review a bit of physiology. Now this equation should look vaguely familiar from medical school or maybe a critical care rotation. So this is the equation for the delivery of oxygen to the tissues. And we care about this because this is often something we're trying to optimize in shock states. Now your right hand term there is going to be the oxygen dissolved in the bloodstream and this is a pretty minor contribution with your PaO2 being the partial pressure of dissolved oxygen in the blood and 0.03 being the solubility coefficient of oxygen. The left hand term here is the oxygen bound to hemoglobin which is the major player. You've got your hemoglobin, your arterial oxygen concentration, and then Hafner's constant. And all of this gets multiplied by Q, your cardiac output. And this is how oxygen is actually delivered to your tissues. This is obviously a key player here. So let's look then at what determines cardiac output. Your cardiac output is going to be equal to your stroke volume. So how much blood is pumped out of the heart with each beat times your heart rate. And as you'll recall, again, from cardiac physiology, things that will affect your stroke volume include preload, afterload, and contractility or inotropy. So when we think about patients who are in shock, who have a low mean arterial pressure, we want to think about which part of this equation is abnormal. So your map is going to be your cardiac output times your systemic vascular resistance, or SVR. And we can use our understanding of this equation, coupled with clinical and ultrasound data, to help us figure out what type of shock is present and how we can go about fixing it. For example, in vasodilatory shock, the problem is going to be very low SVR, systemic vascular resistance. So this is your sepsis, anaphylactic shock, neurogenic shock. In cardiogenic shock, in contrast, the problem is obviously impaired contractility, or very rarely a very low heart rate. In true hypovolemic or hemorrhagic shock, your problem is going to be low preload. And in obstructive shock, the problem may be low left ventricular preload and or high afterload, depending on the nature of the problem and the level of the obstruction. So you can appreciate how by solving for cardiac output, we can much more easily figure out where in this schema our patient lies. So as we said, cardiac output is a key piece of information in the diagnosis of shock NYD. And it can also be really helpful in the choice and titration of therapies. For example, the selection and titration of inotropy for a patient in cardiogenic shock. It's also a useful tool when we think about the use of fluids to augment cardiac output. And we often talk about fluid responsiveness in shock, and especially in patients with septic shock. However, sometimes it's worth taking a step back and thinking about the physiology behind these patients, as they often have a supranormal cardiac output already, as their problem isn't with their cardiac output, but rather with very, very low systemic vascular resistance. They're in vasodilatory shock. So in those cases, sometimes the benefit of additional fluid is questionable, as it may increase preload and increase cardiac output, but this typically isn't the primary problem with these patients. And this is a whole other topic for another time, but it can be really helpful to think about cardiac output as it helps us understand the physiology of these shock states and what we can do to help these patients. So the most common argument to all of this is why not just look at ejection fraction? And basic two-dimensional POCUS is great and can give you a lot of information, but there are going to be times when ejection fraction and cardiac output are not congruent. So a great example of this would be the patient with baseline compensated heart failure with reduced ejection fraction who comes in with undifferentiated shock. Here, for example, we have a 2D echocardiography image in apical four-chamber view, which reveals severely impaired LV function. So coming in, it might suggest that this patient was in cardiogenic shock uh, due to low contractility. However, cardiac output was calculated and shown to actually be on the high end of normal, as indicated by this velocity time integral here, which we'll talk about in a bit. So this instead suggests that the patient likely has a significant vasodilatory component to their shock, so they may in fact be in septic shock, for example. Another example of, of incongruent ejection fraction in cardiac output would be the patient in true hypovolemic shock, as they often will have a hyperdynamic heart and very high ejection fraction, 
but actually a low cardiac output due to low preload. So really what we're getting at here is that cardiac output and stroke volume, especially in acutely unwell patients, are much better reflections of the patient's actual hemodynamics rather than ejection fraction. So with that background in mind, let's talk about how we actually estimate cardiac output using Doppler ultrasound. So the theory is essentially that we want to calculate the stroke volume, which we will multiply by the heart rate to get cardiac output. And your stroke volume is essentially going to be the volume of blood that is in the cylinder that is the left ventricular outflow tract with every heartbeat. So really all we're doing here is calculating the volume of a cylinder. And we'll recall maybe from high school physics that the volume of cylinder is going to be pi times the radius squared times height. And the radius is pretty easily directly measured via 2D echocardiography. And the height of the cylinder is going to correspond to the velocity time integral. So your velocity time integral is going to be a distance in centimeters that you get when you integrate the Doppler measured velocity in the left ventricular outflow tract with respect to time. Uh, and that is, again, going to represent the height of our cylinder, which, as we said, will multiply by the LVOT area calculated from its radius to get a stroke volume. So let's talk about how we actually do this. And as we said, we're going to need two pieces of information, the LVOT radius or diameter divided by two uh, and the LVOT VTI. So first to get your LVOT radius, and as we said, we will measure the diameter and then half it. So we're gonna use a parasternal long axis view and really important to ensure that there's no foreshortening or cylinder effect here. And then we have to zoom again, because this has to be a very precise measurement and there's a lot of potential sources for error. Super important to do everything we can to make sure we're getting the most precise measure possible. So we're gonna zoom then we're gonna freeze our image and scroll to mid systole. Mid systole will be represented by seeing the aortic valve leaflets fully open. And then we're going to use our calipers to measure inner edge to inner edge at the insertion point or within one centimeter, guidelines vary, of the aortic valve leaflets. So here is just an example of a nice parasternal long axis view that you might use for this calculation. And again, you need a pretty good quality view here um, without any foreshortening cylinder effect. You need to clearly be able to see the myocardium in the valves, etc. And here we have a zoomed image with the measurements. You can ignore measurement B there, but measurement A, you can see that we've measured perpendicularly across the left ventricular outflow tract at the insertion points of the aortic valves with those valves nice and open in systole. And our measurement here is two centimeters. Now, one of my POCUS colleagues coined this tongue in cheek term. It doesn't have to be true. It just has to be two. Uh, which is somewhat of a joke, but is meant to highlight the fact that the normal LVOT diameter in adults is about two centimeters, and the standard deviation around this is actually quite small. So the takeaway here is you want to be quite wary of measurements that seem vastly different from two centimeters uh, if they're taken on suboptimal images. As we'll talk about in a second, the LVOT diameter measurement is really the biggest potential source of error in this whole cardiac output calculation. And there are actually some people who favor omitting this step entirely and just using the VTI as a surrogate for stroke volume, which we'll get to in a bit. So be careful with this measurement. And if it seems very off, consider repeating it or potentially just using your VTI as a surrogate. Okay, the second step here is going to be to measure the LVOT VTI. So here we're going to use an apical five chamber view since this allows us to visualize the LVOT itself. And we want to try to optimize the alignment of our view so that the blood flow is going to be parallel to the Doppler line of interrogation. Remember from your principles of Doppler that angles are very key in Doppler ultrasound, and we want to be as parallel to flow as possible. So I like to use color first, and this is just a nice check to ensure that you've got a good strong signal through the LVOT. We should see a nice strong signal of blue blood flowing out of the left ventricular outflow tract. We're then going to use pulse wave Doppler over the LVOT. And we need pulse wave Doppler here for its spatial precisions for a couple of reasons. One, we want to make sure that we're at the same spot where we measured the LVOT diameter. And two, we want to make sure we're not capturing post aortic valve velocity because those are going to be higher. Uh, everyone has higher blood flow on the other side of the aortic valve since it represents a natural narrowing. So really important here to have PW placed just on the ventricular side of the valve. Next, we're going to generate a spectral waveform, freeze it, and then you'll use your calx package, which comes on almost all machines these days, to manually trace the velocity time integral. And your waveform should look like a bright outline with black inside, and this is called the modal velocity. And we wanna trace at the black-white interface. And ideally here, you really wanna trace two to three beats and average them for your best reading, uh, and more if the patient is in atrial fibrillation. 
So this is just an apical five chamber view, nicely showing the left ventricular outflow tract. And again, we're gonna to wanna to place our PW gate within the LVOT, just on the ventricular side of the aortic valve. So you can see that color was used here. We have a nice strong blue signal in the outflow tract. Our PW gate is in the LVOT and your PW gate should be between three and five millimeters generally. And we've generated a nice clear VTI waveform that has been traced here manually to get a VTI of 14.4 for this patient. And next we just have a clip showing this in real time. So we have an apical five chamber view, pulse wave Doppler, and here you can just see some adjustments being made to the baseline and scale to allow for optimal uh, accurate tracing here that's being done manually. So now that we have both pieces of information, what we can do is plug this information into the equation to calculate cardiac output. Uh, and note that you'll obviously need to record heart rate as well, as this is part of the equation. Now you can do this manually if you'd really like, or I suggest using an easy online calculator. This one here from the Canadian Society of Echocardiography is the one that I keep bookmarked on my phone for this. So as we mentioned before briefly, it's important to note that the biggest source of error in this whole calculation is the two-dimensional LVOT diameter measurement. And remember that any errors there are going to be magnified because the radius term is squared in our equation. So because of that, some people actually advocate for skipping this step and using the VTI alone as a surrogate for stroke volume. And there are a lot of advantages to this. As we said, it takes out the biggest source of error. It's great if your peristernal long axis view is unavailable or suboptimal for 2D measurements. Uh, it's really good for trending values serially in response to therapy in a single patient because obviously their LVOT diameter is not going to vary over time. So the only varying term will be their VTI. It's great in time crunch scenarios. So for example, a recess in the emergency room. And it actually may be a better predictor of long-term outcomes, which is some interesting recent data that we'll talk about in a bit. On the flip side of that, there are a couple of reasons why it might be useful to calculate cardiac output, at least sometimes. I think this may be an easier value to conceptualize or understand if you're speaking to practitioners who aren't as POCUS savvy, as it's a bit of a more familiar term when you're conveying information. And I also think it's quite a useful exercise for teaching purposes, as it just highlights the impact of various components of the equation on cardiac output. For example, the impact of compensatory tachycardia to maintain cardiac output in a patient with low stroke volume. Now, if you want to go through the exercise of estimating this, maybe just for educational purposes, uh, or just to have some sort of rough figure, but you're not able to get an LVOT diameter measurement, you can use the assumption of a standard two centimeter LVOT diameter and plug that into your equation and get, as we said, just a rough guess of a cardiac output figure. Here we just have some normal values. So normal for your LVOT VTI is going to be 18 to 22 centimeters. Stroke volumes uh, should be between 60 and 120 milliliters, and a normal cardiac output is four to eight liters per minute. And these are all in adults, of course. Okay, time to talk a bit about pitfalls. As we've alluded to, there's definitely pitfalls and sources of error with this, especially with the LVOT diameter measurement. So remember, you need a good quality image, you need to be zoomed, and you wanna make sure you're making your measurement properly. So measuring perpendicularly, at the insertion point of the valve leaflets, in systole, uh, and measuring inner edge to inner edge. Measuring the VTI is actually a little bit more forgiving of suboptimal 2D images, as you can still get a reasonable Doppler trace. More important here is gonna be alignment uh, and making sure that your blood flow is parallel to your Doppler line of interrogation. And usually you have about 30 degrees of flexibility. Beyond that, you're gonna to introduce too much air into your measurement, and I wouldn't suggest trying this technique. You also wanna make sure obviously your PW gate is properly placed. So you wanna be within the LVOT on the ventricular side. You wanna be close enough to the aortic valve that you're seeing an aortic closing click in your Doppler waveform. And we'll show an example of that. Uh, and you wanna make sure that your measurement itself is accurate. And this can actually be quite hard to do with gloves on, uh, but some things you can do to help yourself out are optimizing your sweep speed, your scale, your gain, etc. So we'll briefly talk about a little bit of evidence for this. This was an old study comparing various methods of Doppler echocardiographic methods of measuring stroke volume. And they essentially found that the method we've just described, so measuring the LVOT diameter in a peristernal long axis, and then measuring the LVOT VTI was the most accurate within about three milliliters of the gold standard via thermodilution. So pretty impressive. This was another fairly old study, again, just indicating the reliability of these measurements. 
In this study, they found that the inter and intra observer variability was within 10% for these measurements. So pretty reasonable, um, especially given that we recognize we're not obtaining an exact figure with these measurements, but more of an estimate to help us make clinical decisions and guide our therapy. And finally, this is a more recent paper that looked at patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction over time as outpatients and found that LVOT VTI and having a very low LVOT VTI was a better predictor of adverse outcomes than either ejection fraction or their Doppler-derived cardiac output. And this is interesting, and I think A reflects the fact that when you calculate cardiac output, you introduce some additional error because of the LVOT diameter measurement, but also speaks to the fact that, again, VTI may be a more useful predictor of the actual hemodynamics rather than just ejection fraction. Finally, for those who are interested, these are another couple great papers that provide sort of comprehensive reviews about this and other advanced critical care echocardiography topics. Um, so I highly recommend reading these for anyone who's interested. Okay, so to finish off, we'll just go through a few examples of VTI tracing, including a few where there are factors that could have been optimized. So this tracing here is actually pretty reasonable. We see that, again, we were in an apical five chamber view. We had color Doppler applied and then a, our pulse wave Doppler gate placed on the ventricular side of the aortic valve. We've got a nice spectral waveform with a bright modal velocity and then a dark interior. Uh, and we've manually traced our VTI to get a figure of 18.3 centimeters. And in your calyx package on your machine, this is usually gonna be included under the cardiac output heading or sometimes LVOT or aortic valve. Uh, it'll be slightly different on each machine. This is an example of a case where the measurement conditions were suboptimal, however, they still helped provide us with some useful information. So this was actually a patient who went into rapid and sudden shock following bronchoscopy and was thought to be perhaps an overwhelming septic shock. And it was very interesting to see that his echo revealed severely decreased ejection fraction as well as a very, very low VTI. Now you can see that our measurement here is suboptimal for a couple of reasons, the most important one being our alignment. So our apical five chamber view is lying obliquely on the screen. And because of that, we know that our VTI is likely gonna be underestimated. However, even with that caveat, a VTI of six centimeters is extremely low. And so we can pretty confidently say that this patient was likely in predominantly cardiogenic shock and our therapies were directed to try to target that. This is then a repeat measurement of the same patient taken a few hours later with the addition of inotropy. So again, we recognize that our measurement is gonna be suboptimal and the actual number itself in this case is probably less important than the trend over time. Here we can see that the VTI has almost doubled with the addition of inotropy and that correlated with a positive clinical change. So really nice for following these patients over time. I'll also point out that you can see a nice example of the aortic valve closing click here as this bright line after each spectral waveform. And that indicates that your PW gate is in the right position close enough to the aortic valve within the LVOT. Here is an example where we have a reasonable trace from probably a pretty difficult two-dimensional image. However, to optimally measure this, we might have increased our sweep speed to stretch these waveforms more across the screen and make it easier to measure. The other thing we know with these waveforms is that there is some variation beat to beat, which might be with respiration, for example. So ideally we would measure several of these and then average them. This is just a pretty stunning example to show you what aortic regurgitation looks like, which you will capture on this image because you're in the LVOT and you're gonna see regurgitant flow through the aortic valve if there is any. So that's the flow that here is above the baseline and actually aliased completely, generating this pretty impressive waveform pattern. All right, that's everything for today. Thank you guys so much for watching and I hope that you found this useful. For more screencasts like this and other POCUS resources, be sure to visit us online at ubcimpocus.com and also follow us on Twitter. Thanks so much and happy scanning.